Hello, and thank you for joining me. I'm Elizabeth Burden, your host for AZ Illustrated Arts, coming to you this week from Studio B. Tonight, learn how a local restaurant represents a piece of the American dream for some Ethiopian refugees. I'll talk with author C.E. Poverman about his new novel of obsession, self-destruction, and loss called Love by Drowning. Meet artist Christina Cardenas, whose work often explores the complexities of feminine identity. And visit three places in Tucson where art and architecture come together, part of the legacy of designer Charles Clement. But first, today's top stories. The Goldwater Institute filed suit today on behalf of 36 Republican members of the legislature and two Arizona citizens. The suit contends the way the state is paying for the expansion of Medicaid is unconstitutional. Attorneys for Goldwater told Arizona Public Media the fee hospitals agreed to pay to fund the expansion is in fact a tax and needed a two-thirds vote in the legislature, not the simple majority it received. The suit was filed one day after a referendum effort to repeal the Medicaid expansion failed to get the necessary signatures to make the November 2014 ballot. The Medicaid expansion requires Arizona to accept federal dollars made available by the Affordable Care Act, commonly known as Obamacare. When Governor Brewer agreed to accept that money, she ran afoul of many in her party. Sedona may be the next municipality in the state to recognize civil unions between same-sex couples. The Sedona City Council will take a final vote on the issue in two weeks. If Sedona does recognize civil unions for same-sex couples, it will join Tucson, Jerome, and Bisbee, all of which have some level of recognition of civil unions. And the University of Arizona is part of a group receiving over $5.5 million to develop the next generation of wireless communication. As more devices use wireless, the part of the electromagnetic spectrum they use gets more clogged, and researchers are hoping to ease the clog for the next generation of wireless devices. And that's a look at tonight's headlines. Cafe Desta is a Tucson restaurant specializing in Ethiopian cuisine. In addition to the usual challenges faced by an independent restaurant, there is a deeper story. Next, Luis Carrion shows us how this small business was born out of the pain and devastation and the hopes and aspirations of a group of Ethiopian refugees inspired by the American dream. If you happen to be a fan of ethnic foods, you may have noticed that the options available in Tucson are increasing. A relative newcomer to the local dining scene is Cafe Desta, located just south of downtown Tucson. Smaller one? A small, but for him chicken. Hari Drizki is one of the owners of Cafe Desta. He's from Ethiopia. He's tall, lean, and works efficiently as he prepares for the lunch rush. He also has a PhD from the University of Arizona in microbiology. He says the restaurant is now owned and managed by a group of refugees. We try to give an opportunity for the newcomers, the immigrants from Eritrea and Ethiopia, uh, an opportunity for employment. A steady place of employment, a connection with a growing community of refugees, and an important step in finding a sense of place in a new environment. This is what Derziski says Cafe Desta hopes to provide. He also says that the food is an important part of the overall vision of the business. And here, it's served communally like it was in his homeland. It's almost the same how we eat, and then usually back home, all the kids come together in the circle this way, and the mother watches with the different stuff, and then she adds whenever you finish it. Talahon Mola, also from Ethiopia, started the restaurant a little over two years ago. He says the vision for the business has evolved over time, but he knew from the beginning that he wanted to serve the growing community of refugees in Tucson. The idea is to have as many of the Ethiopian and Eritrean community to work here. When we visited the folks at Cafe Desta, the workers were busy preparing the food for that day. Mola says that much of the food is cooked ahead of time and served to order with injera. That's the traditional flatbread made from fermented teff grain. This is ground to a flour and then that's used, you know, fermented and cooked. The injera is used to scoop up the various cooked foods into bite-sized morsels. The menu includes fish, chicken, beef, and an assortment of vegetarian dishes. And everything is eaten communally. 
Hey, how, how are you doing? Good. Aaron Grigg is program manager for the International Rescue Committee in Tucson. His organization is one of several in the area helping to rebuild the lives of people forced to flee their homelands. Uh, we focus on helping refugees here in the United States who have fled their countries due to persecution or well-founded fear of persecution due to race, religion, nationality, political opinion. Do you, do you still need to talk to Christy? Yes. Grig says Cafe Desta uses a collective ownership business model that allows members of the Ethiopian refugee community to integrate into the cultural fabric of Tucson. It's neat when you see these individuals who have come as refugees, they have nothing. And yet now they're contributing to the community. That's what we want to see. And that's what really the Refugee Resettlement Program is about. Grig says Cafe Desta is not just another great restaurant in Tucson, but it's an example of the way refugees can contribute to our community. You know, a lot of the work I do in my department is really around um, helping people that are, have gone through severe trauma and, and helping them tap into their strengths not only they're tapping into their strengths, but I think our society is also benefiting from that. Because stories like Cafe Desta can be inspirational to others. The inspiration for the collective at Cafe Desta continues, and plans are now in development to expand the business to the empty space next door. In both short stories and full-length novels, author C.E. Poverman's works explore the psyche. His first book of stories, The Black Velvet Girl, won the Iowa School of Letters Award for Short Fiction. His second, Skin, was nominated for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. His stories have appeared in many anthologies, including O. Henry and Pushcart. Here to talk with us about his newest novel and the consciousness of writing is C.E. Poverman. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Liz. Reviews have described Love by Drowning as a psychological mystery or a psychological thriller. How would you describe the book? I think that's good as far as it goes. I, I really think um, that's a structure for the complexity of, of the characters and um, I think that works. What would be your synopsis then of this novel? Oh, <laughs> that's always a tough one. Um, probably the, the through line, the simple action is that um, Val for um, 17 years has been fighting, going back, or connecting in any way with Leanne. And uh, several things happen. His father dies. He's now got a teenage son who's enraged, out of control, and he's never been able to resolve uh, what has happened between his brother and himself, his brother Davis. And uh, uh, Leanne, all these years, has been sending him unsigned postcards, which are fragments. And all of these um, elements set in motion um, finally prove overwhelming for, for Val, and he has to go back and uh, find out what's going on with this woman. So there are a myriad of underlying themes in that description, uh, like the lingering wound of tragedy and loss, right. uh, forgiveness, starting over, obsession, yeah. self-destruction. Where did you start in terms of exploring the issues that Val's confronting? The, um, in terms of the, what you're looking for when you're trying to set a novel in motion is you're trying to create a playing field, uh, a place where the character can, can act or um, where he can create and transform his world. And that, that um, w is set in motion really in the backstory with Val. Um, and we get the opening scene, which I don't want to reveal too much about, but, but um, with, with between Val and Davis and the Marlin. And so that, that took place in 1984. It's now 17 years later. And so that's really what, what sets those two, two timelines are what set the story in motion. Now, a library a journal review mentioned that Val and right. Davis, the two main, two of the main characters, the brothers, right. were separated by, and their quote was, the crushing weight of paternal expectation. Is that an apt description, do you think? Uh, I think that's, yes, I do think that's an apt description. I was a little startled when I read that um, 
that review, but when I thought it over, but just that phrase, and um, I actually thought the reviewer completely got the book. I was very gratified by that. Um, I would say that, that both the brothers struggle with the father's sense of expectation, each in his own way. You mentioned the three main characters, so Val and Davis and Leanne. In my reading of this, there's something off balance about each of them. Um, what did you find interesting ab about each? You talk about setting the playing field for them in the novel. Right, what right. did you find interesting about exploring each of them? Um, Val um, has a moment um, when he is in law school and he um, and he's working in a prosecutor's office and he discovers that people lie. The, the prosecutor lies, and for him, uh, he cannot continue with law school. He can't. He, he can't go any farther. Um, drops out. Um, so that that is is a, is sort of a major imbalance in in Val's backstory. Davis's backstory, or his story, is really that um, he's an extremely gifted in every way. He's he's extremely handsome. He's a great athlete. Um, and he's very street smart, and he's very smart, but um, he's dyslexic, and nobody um, knows it um, until it's too late, until he's damaged, until he's basically enraged. And uh, so I was exploring that. And with Leanne, um, where can I begin with Leanne? <laughs> well, before maybe you get to Leanne, I'm going to ask you to read a couple excerpts from the book. One um, that relates to Val, and one that relates to Leanne, and then we can come back to very good, Leanne. Very good. I'll, I'll just read the opening paragraph. Um, this section is called Marlin. Val shifted his eyes from the bait riding just beyond the wake and glanced back toward his brother. Davis surveyed the horizon, arms crossed, a white sun visor shading his eyes, wireman's gloves tucked into the back pocket of his shorts. Last night, Val had been as terrified of Davis as he had of anyone or anything in his life. It had been over Leanne. Face half hidden by wild, bleach blonde hair, her eyes averted, she had obsessed Val from that first moment weeks ago when she had stumbled in with Davis, something concealed in her gaze. And then last night, her suddenly stepping into him, fitting her mouth to his. Now, 65 miles off the North Carolina coast, nostrils packed with blood stiffened cotton, Val felt his broken nose throb. Davis wasn't talking to him. And now I'll move to another place. And this is written from Val. Leanne's first-person point of view, and um, she has come into Val's house, and uh, nobody is home. The bolt, the bolt snaps back, and the door suddenly swings open. Listening a moment, is this me, Leanne? I step inside and pull the door closed behind me. What am I doing? I'm waiting to see. A little part of me wants to stop, but I just walk into the small kitchen and stop at the counter. Turn slowly, spot a stack of grocery store coupons on the windowsill, a school lunch schedule on the refrigerator, papers on the counters, bills, school announcements, letters, invitations. I read an envelope, Ms. Kaz Martin. Kaz, his wife. Martin. She took his last name. I weigh that, taking his last name. To lose yourself, disappear, or be smothered, or start over, go free, reappear as someone else. And Kaz, what's that? Catherine, Cassandra, Karen. I slide the letter out of the envelope, blur of writing, read a sentence, but then the rest of the house pulls me and I drop it on the counter. So the novel is written in, in sh different ways with shifting points of view. Why write from different points of view, and what are the challenges and opportunities of that? Um, 
I wrote from her, from the third person point of view, from Val's third person point of view, anywhere from a distant third person point of view to a close third person point of view, because the character in every novel you're writing, you're looking for an organizing principle. And this allowed me the broadest range of movement for my character. It was his story. He was the one with something at stake. It allowed me to explore his range of emotions and his range of different times with Davis growing up and in, now again in the present. Um, with Leanne, I heard her. I heard her very clearly and I felt her. And so it's not, um, you know, it, it, you try things. And so I, where I heard her and where things were happening, I tried her. And there she was. She fit in every place. I introduced her, she fit. The book is Love by Drowning. C.E. Poverman, thanks so much for joining Thank me. Thank you. Author C.E. Poverman will host a book release event in Tucson at Clues Unlimited Bookstore this Friday from 5 to 7 p.m. He will also be a featured speaker in the University of Arizona Poetry Center's Prose Reading Series next Thursday, September 19th at 7 p.m. Secretary of State John Kerry met today with his Russian counterpart in Geneva as both search for a diplomatic solution to securing serious chemical weapons. Also tonight, the remarkable life story of an internet genius who was almost certainly the first victim of 9-11, murdered as he tried to stop the hijackers on one of the planes to hit the World Trade Center. And we begin a new series where poetry lives. Once upon a midnight dreary. Once, Once upon, upon a midnight dreary. Jeffrey Brown teams up with poet laureate Natasha Trethaway to examine a program aimed at improving the lives of people with Alzheimer's disease. When Gary said Emma Lazarus, you immediately said, Give me your tired, your poor, your yeah. huddled masses. masses. Good evening, I'm Gwen Eiffel. And I'm Judy Woodruff. Those are just some of the stories we're covering on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Air pollution turned waterways acidic for decades. Now it's the opposite. Rivers are turning alkaline because the acid is eating away rocks. We're basically dissolving the surface of the earth. It's ending up in our water. It's like rivers on rollades. There's a natural antacid in, in these watersheds. I'm Renee Montaigne, a new threat to water on the next morning edition from NPR News. Tucson-based artist Christina Cardenas is known for work that explores the American experience from a bicultural feminist perspective. Her paintings are in the permanent collections of museums in the United States and Mexico, including the Tucson Museum of Art. Next, Luis Carrion visits Cardenas for this edition of Open Studio. When you walk into Cristina Cárdenas' studio, it's easy to see the color plays an important role in her art. Vibrant yellows and deep reds mingle with the delicate shadows of her subjects. Various projects fill the corners of her space, and even the scraps of paper near her work area become an impromptu canvas as she talks. I am Cristina Cárdenas. I am a teaching artist, and I have been a professional artist for for uh, almost all my life. I mean, I started when I was uh, like 14. Cardenas is a Tucson-based artist with deep roots in Mexico. When we visited her, she was busy finishing tiles that would be included in a public art installation for the Sunlinks Modern Streetcar Project. It would be interesting to know if I'm the first Latina, Chicana, uh, Mexican artists in Tucson, from Tucson, who get this kind of public art. Cardena Studio is located in the Citizens Warehouse in downtown Tucson, literally only a few feet away from the passing trains. Well, welcome to Citizens. <laughs> Among the various projects in different stages of completion throughout the room are several that include images of women. I'm trying to empower women with symbols, and that's why my, all my women are very strong. 
At the same time, I want to say that uh, women in, in the culture, do, we are the ones who really carry the whole history of our, our town and our people. Cárdenas is quick to let you know that her history has deep roots in Mexico, where she first began to study art in Guadalajara. However, she's been in Tucson for decades, and she says she now navigates a bicultural world. I'm exploring being Mexican and in a, in a, being an immigrant and being, being uh, foreign. I, I mean, I'm still not totally from here. And uh, the sad thing is I go to Mexico, and I'm from Mexico. And they don't consider me Mexican because I left, I left they, I mean, Mexico 20-something years ago. So, I, yeah, I had the identity issue uh, in, in that regard. As an artist with, as she puts it, an identity issue, Cárdenas is constantly exploring what it means to be a woman living between two cultures and in the borderlands of her adoptive home, Tucson. In her latest series, she works from images of pachucas, young Chicana women that she found online on social media. A pachuca is the, the one that they dress like a certain style, and they're very proud, and sometimes they belong to a, a una ganga, a, a gang. Cárdenas, who also teaches art at a local charter school, says the young Mexican-American girl she sees there remind her of the identity struggles that she herself has navigated. My student really gave me the ideas where to go, and they, they're such a, a beautiful girls. I mean, all dress up for high school, all makeup, a lot of makeup. It's like, you know, fashion, fashion uh, parade or something. Cárdenas says her impulse as a young artist trended to the political and she dealt with immigration and border issues for much of her career. It was all political. It's all about the border. However, Cárdenas says she's evolved and in recent years turned more to her own personal experiences to guide her art. It's my desire that every piece is, is telling you a, a story and is telling you my story or um, the story of my community. In Tucson, we are surrounded by examples of ways that art and architecture can combine. New projects like the modern streetcar are being designed with artistic elements in mind. This continues an approach that was taken by many of the architects who worked during the building boom of the 1950s and 60s. Next, Damian Klinko, president of the Tucson Historical Preservation Foundation, takes Mark McLemore on a tour of three places where the work of designer Charles Clement can still be found. Art and architecture have always been intertwined. Artists for a millennium have ornamented sacred spaces and decorated the places we live and play. After World War II and during the post-war economic boom, a new vision for architecture and art emerged. In Tucson, a handful of artists began working with architects to develop new concepts of expression integrated into building. Of these artists, Charles Alfred Clement is one of the better known. Like this 1966-1967 fiberglass sculpted screen for the University of Arizona Administration Building, his work is scattered throughout Tucson's urban environment and is often missed. Damien, our studios are in the building next door here to the Administration Building, so my coworkers and I have walked past this sculpture probably thousands of times, but I don't know how many times we've really noticed it. In America, after World War II, architecture shifted to a much simpler, clean aesthetic called modernism. Um, and people commissioning buildings and architects were looking for ways to humanize the, the, these architectural spaces. And one of the ways to do that was to integrate art into, into the buildings. So Charles Clement worked primarily in Tucson in the 1950s, 60s, um, and early 1970s. And this work is very geometric in form. It's three panels of cast concrete and fiberglass um, that work together to, uh, to create this sort of undulating pattern. This building was designed in 1966 by the architectural firm of Place in Place. Fred Sims was the chief um, architectural designer. And the building uh, really embraces a more international style and, and really served as an um, administrative function and was an office building. Clement established himself as a versatile freelance artist. He worked as a muralist, both with mosaics and ceramics, developed architectural sculpture, painted and developed metalwork. 
His often lyrical and sweet work embraced animal and flora abstractions. Near the corner of River Road in Campbell is his 1966 large relief cement mural designed for the Catalina Foothills School District and architects Cook and Schwaim. Well, what a fun design this is in this mural, something that Charles Clement was commissioned to add to this building. Tell us about the history of where we are right now. Clement was um, commissioned to design a mural that really captures, I think, the spirit of childhood. Um, it uses animals and um, in a very lyrical form that takes a very clean, crisp, sort of sterile architectural um, expression and humanizes it, making it sweet. But the design of the animals is still reflective of Clement's time. Absolutely. The, art, the artwork is an abstraction of animal forms. Um, it has this wonderful sort of rhythmic, almost um, uh, wave-like quality to it. Originally, it had integrated color. It had reds and sort of earth tones. Um, sometime in the um, early 2000s, it was whitewashed over with a solid color, and a little bit of the um, character-defining features diminished. Hopefully, one day, someone will bring it back. And looking at it, we both enjoyed the idea that children who came to this building in years past were able to enjoy this design and the work of Mr. Clement. I mean, this was a school facility, and so it's really wonderful that these architects who really took a very sophisticated, clean, modern aesthetic, integrated and used Clement to, to really humanize again and, and sweeten the architecture um, with, this, with this design that would appeal to children and would make the building really relevant and set it in its time and its place. Clement died in July of 1981 on a trip overseas. One of Clement's last works in Tucson is this memorial in the Jewish quarter of Evergreen Cemetery. The graceful lines of this meditative space seem to capture his grounded sense of balance, tone, and gravity. The undulating forms, the irregular use of space, and cast concrete, all indicative of his work. One thing we observed earlier was it almost seems like Charles Clement had anticipated the weathering of the uh, surface of this uh, over time. Modern architecture, when it deteriorates, it often just looks worn out. But this memorial, as it's aged, the concrete has eroded and cracked, and it's taken on this beautiful patina. So unlike some of his other work that tended to be more exuberant, this, this uses cast concrete, these sort of very subtle forms, to really ground and create something that's, that's meditative, thoughtful, and a place where someone could come and reflect. It's really a beautiful, beautiful monument, not only to the Jewish community here in Tucson and to the people who, that this monument was created for, but to Clement himself and his artistic contributions in the 20th century. There will be a celebration of Tucson's mid-century designs and architecture, including work of artists like Charles Clement, during Tucson Modernism Week, happening October 3rd through the 6th. There's more information online at tucsonmod.com. I'm Elizabeth Burden. Thank you for watching AZ Illustrated Arts. To post a comment on any of our stories or to keep up with the latest news, visit our website, azpm.org.